Welcome to Auto Shop Showcase with Gary Gunn. Today's guest is Brian Kelly. And I have a really unique showcase uh, participant today. His name is Brian Kelly. He owns an automotive repair shop. We've known each other for many, many years. And I thought his story was worth telling. So I want you to listen really close because it's powerful. Now, he owns an automotive repair shop and lives four and a half hours away from it. And it runs really basically on its own. So, Brian, how did you get from working in it every day to where you are today? Kind of a simple story for us. Yeah, thanks for asking, Gary. Um, man, I'll tell you, I spent uh, I spent a lot of time in the early days in the business. And, uh, you know, as you ask the question, I, I even, in my mind, I, I turn this over a little bit. and I, I think back to the uh, the days of every day in at the helm, whether it was in my office, whether it was at the front counter, whether it was circle in the bays. And, you know, I, I found, um, man, I want to say probably 10, 10 or 12 years ago uh, is when this process began. And uh, I can tell you, maybe it wasn't even intentional when it began, but uh, I found myself so preoccupied with other things around me, uh, whether it was my chamber of commerce, whether it was my auto association, my rotary club, um, it could be doing different community activities. I always think of this fishing derby that we'd spend three days on. And so there was this, this need showed up, this, uh, this need for my time outside the business. And, you know, before you knew it, I was spending my time doing those things um, instead of working in the business. And, and as I say that, there, there could be some confusion too, because it might sound like, oh, he's not working on the business. Um, and I would say just the opposite. I would say I was deeply invested in the business, just not necessarily mm -hmm. on site every day. So, so the productive things for me became, how are we strategizing? How are we planning? How are we marketing? How am I leading the, uh, the team inside the company? And, and how are they responsible for their own actions? And those things started to show up, you know, and, and obviously probably day one, but it mm -hmm. became, it became what I would say intentional after five or six years of, of being in business. And, and really I, I began running those kind of plays all the way through. And, and I found myself, um, three and a half years ago coming to my, my team and saying, Hey guys, uh, I'm thinking about moving. And and I can still remember this meeting. We we do a every morning we do just a quick toolbox meeting in the in the shop. And I gather everybody around and we we have these we do a little exercise of what are you grateful for today? And we go through our gratefulness. And I said, guys, before we go over numbers, I just I got a quick one for you. And I want to I want to just get some head nods. And I'm really thinking about moving out of the state. And and I have an idea that there's some things I want to do. And uh, I want to know if I have your support. And, you know, I, my expectation of what was coming next is much different than what happened. I, I expected some disappointment, some dismay, and I got laughter. I got a whole team that oh, went wow. into laughter. And, and I remember thinking, what the, where's the laughter going? And, you know, once it calmed down, I said, what, what's so funny? And, and my general manager goes, well, you don't really do anything here anyway. So what difference would that make? <laughs> and, and at first I took, I mean, you know, my ego got up and I went, oh, well, you know, who's, yeah. how, how dare you say don't do anything? Um, and I realized that my daily activity in here, nobody came to me. They didn't need my help unless it was a catastrophic wow. event. And, and that was where the freedom showed up. That was where it really clicked for me to say, I've already been managing this way. So, my detachment, um, and I, for a while in the beginning, I would come back about every two and a half or three weeks, I'd show back up. And uh, eventually that kind of phased out. I show up maybe every other month, sometimes three months. Um, and and what has happened in, in transition is it's not my face is there, but just I would call it as a culture, as a, a way of engaging and, and being, um, but I, I'm not needed. And in fact, when I show up on site now, I, I kind of chuckle because there really isn't, I, I have an office that's never used and I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. 
you know? So, so I, I think, I think back and, and the questions become, what did I do that was, was so effective with it? And yeah, it, it came down to empowering people. It came down to allowing people to do their jobs and ultimately be responsible for it. Yeah. A good friend of ours. I know, you know, Richard Flint okay. mm -hmm. scenario right here. He always says, you, you, you always want to run your business with your, when, when you're not there, your presence is still there. Okay. And so thanks for sharing that short story there. There's a lot more to it. And on other videos down the road, I'm sure we'll get a lot more information. So Brian, thanks for that quick scenario there of how you went from where you are to where you, where you are today. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we're back back here with Brian Kelly. Uh, a few more things I want to discuss with him. And, and you know, Brian, in our industry, there's a lot of shops that have two or three technicians, maybe four. The owner is the service advisor. And, and you're talking about a self-led team so that they can be absent from the business. And they can't even envision that. So I know you've learned a lot of things along the road. So what... Can you share with the people listening to this video about, hey, if Brian can do it, I can do it. So wow. share on, buddy. Yeah, Gary, you take me back with that question. That uh, I remember opening the doors to the business. And uh, I, had, yeah. I had a crew of three technicians working with me um, and myself at the front counter. And uh, yep. I mean, I can remember literally I was cleaning toilets. I was selling service. I was doing oil changes. I was every mm -hmm. position in that business. And at the same time, purging shelves because we had inventory that was probably from the sixties. And, uh, you know, this is just, <laughs> just walking into a business that I, I purchased someone out from. And, uh, and I, I remember, uh, gosh, and this, this gets even better because, uh, this particular location, I had an apartment upstairs and, uh, my wife to be, says to me, she says, you know, you could, you could get expenses down if you moved in. And, uh, I don't, I don't know if I recommend this one, but, uh, <laughs> we did it for a few years and uh -huh. you know, in, in doing it, my whole life was encompassed with the business. Everything was there. Yeah. And I mean, I woke up at five, I went down my stairs and I was in the office and if something needed yeah. to be done, I, I did it. And there was, there was nothing. I wasn't doing at that point in time. And I can remember answering the phone under a car, um, you know, probably changing an exhaust manifold. And as a matter of fact, the story I'm thinking of right now, I'm answering the phone, I'm working on a motorhome and I'm doing an exhaust manifold on an E350. And, and the phone rings, I grab it and it's a, a person who works for me now. And uh, her name's Emily and she's on the other line. And, She's she's calling because she had heard that I was potentially looking for somebody to answer the phone. And I remember thinking to myself, and this is, you know, you can think about, you only know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. And yeah. at the time, the, the thought going through my head is, would I really pay somebody to answer the phone? I mean, I can do this just fine. You know, manifold in one hand, phone yeah, in the sure, other. Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah. You know, and, and it's just going to be another cost. And I said, you know, thanks. Thanks for the call. I'm, I'll get back to you in a day or two. And, uh, you know, hung the phone up, went back about my day. And, and the whole time I'm thinking, you know, what's this person going to do for me except cost me money? And uh, mm. I found myself calling her back two days later. I said, hey, Emily, tell you what, why don't we, why don't we bring you on site? And uh, let's just, let's see how you do for, for the next day. And, uh, you know, I'll pay you, and I don't know, at the time, the wage is probably 10 bucks an hour, 10 or 12. And uh, I'll pay you 10 bucks an hour to be on site. Um, I'll let a little working interview. And we'll, we'll try it for two days. And uh, I'm not going to say I had an epiphany right then and there. But what I'm going to tell you is I realized I was getting more stuff done. And that oh yeah, in my head, she's just answering the phone. But she's doing a whole lot more. And, mm -hmm. and, and I began to notice that uh, the work I was doing was more efficient. Um, I was able to help her a little bit and begin to educate her as to how I thought things should run. And, and there were some lessons coming for me I wasn't even prepared for there. But I began to show her her ways to do it. I began to interface with my technicians better. And I, I just realized that I gained everything mm. around me that I didn't even know I was missing. And, and it really, it started with that first interaction. And 
and I would say there was a, an element in that hire that she was the right person for that job and her ability to take responsibility. I didn't know it at the time is what began to open up more opportunity for me. And, you know, I, I think back to that, just, I, I smile because had I made a different hire with somebody who wasn't responsible, somebody who wouldn't take it, who knows, might've taken me another five years to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. That's a great story. And thanks for sharing that because that's reality in our automotive world. We know shop owners that they they do it so long and they just get so worn out. They they can't think past where they are. So Brian, thanks you for sharing that. And folks, if you're listening to this, man, and you want to know how to get out of where you are, just contact us. That's all we ask you to do. 270. 282-1262. Just give me a call. We'll talk about it. Maybe you're a candidate. Maybe you're not. But we need to find out. Just, just a quick phone call. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, folks, we're back again. You know, Brian Kelly, we've been talking a few times on these uh, videos we've been doing. And there was a there was a lady named Emily that he mentioned early on when he was working under that motorhome. And and getting this stuff work done and the phone rang. And so where's Emily now? Is she working in some other industry? Did you fire her? Where, where, where's Emily today after that that providential phone call with you under that motorhome? So walk us through where Emily is today. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question, Gary. So we talked a little bit about Emily and you know, the last conversation. I was under the motorhome taking a phone call and and doing essentially a two-day working interview with her. And uh, you fast forward today, she's been with me 20 years um, going wow. on, you know, 20 give or take, years, give or take 20 years. And I, with full transparency, I'm actually going to say there's a two and a half year hiatus there um, where I would tell mm. you that uh, we came to a conflict. Um, we couldn't resolve it and she left. Mm. And, uh, wow. you know, so there, there's a little break in there and, uh, I would actually tell you it was one of the greatest lessons for both of us. And, you know, I took okay. somebody, I took somebody who came in and, and as I alluded to, even in that first conversation, I learned something. And in return, I found myself training her. And so this, this was a, a relationship that just, it worked in time. And uh, we came to a point where I had expectations and these expectations mm -hmm. weren't being met. Um, and I, I would say there was, even some youthful leadership. I think I was uh, at the time, early thirties, 32, 33. So okay. she worked for me for six years, seven years at that point. And, um, you know, there, there came a point where I, I would actually, again, transparency tell you, I had some unrealistic expectations. I wanted perfection. And, and you know what? I, I know guys who think like this, it's gotta be done. It's gotta be done right. And it's always gotta be right. And, and I, I learned something in that, which was, Perfection don't exist. Perfection is nothing more than false reality swirling around in my head. And uh, I, I lost a great employee out of the deal. And uh, you know, two and a half years later, uh, she came, you know, she said, hey, you know, I know you, uh, you're looking for an advisor. I'd love to come work for you again. And, and, and me, <laughs> me being me, well, you know, there's a process for that. I, I'm aware. And, and so she went through the full interview process, did, did an on the job working interview again. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we came back to the team and said, all right, team, what do you think? You know, and of course my team loved her anyway. So they, why are you even asking us? But, but they, of course yeah. we know the process and uh, yeah. she came back on and, you know, that was almost, almost 10 years ago now. And uh, wow. so she's, wow. she's still here. She runs the shop. Um, and, and she is my general manager. She takes care of, I would say she is the first line of defense for me, um, before anything gets to me. And that's, that's her role. You know, she's, she's a, she, she still does right service on the front counter. She mm -hmm. manages the operation. She manages the technicians. Um, and then she's the first point of contact for anything under the, uh, the garage. And, you know, okay. she's. She does it. She does it well. She does it with a smile. And, uh, you know, honestly, as, as I say, she learns from me and uh, I learn from her at times. So it's a it's a great yeah. relationship. There's something you hit right there that I've always heard and perfection destroys profit. OK, and 
a friend of mine had 38 stores. An individual said, if you can live with an 80% a B minus, the store running on a B minus, he said, you can have multiple operations. And you can be absent from this business if you can just be okay with 80%. If you can't, don't do it. Perfection is what will kill your profit. People aren't perfect. No. And that's, and that's just reality. And people are going to make mistakes. People are going to let yeah. you down. And I, you know, I, one of the lessons I had to learn was that I had to allow that ego that existed to be okay with that. The business didn't define me. Yeah. I defined the business. And, and that was something, I mean, I struggled with it. No question about it. And, and in that period where I lost Emily working for me, that's one of those areas where it started to manifest and reveal itself was, mm. you know, what's, what's slowing you down here? Oh, oh, your, your own ego is imagine that <laughs> I'm, I'm fighting myself. We never do that. Do we? We're no. not, never our own worst enemy. E e ego can get you bloody pretty fast. Okay. okay. Oh, and yeah. that can, you can make a lot of dumb leadership decisions with your ego. Yeah. Would I, so, would I rather be right or would I rather be in relationship? I've always got the choice. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for sharing that short story about Emily. And I'm glad she's still there. And I'm glad you all have figured out how to make this work. That's that's uh, that's uh, that's tough. That's hard to do. But uh, thanks for sharing that story about Emily. And folks, you know, you you hear Brian's story. And you know, this can be yours also. It can be your story. It could be one of your sons or one of your daughters that is in the business with you, and that happens a lot, or a brother or somebody that's in your family that could be the heir apparent to the business, you better watch out because you might want to sell this business somewhere down the road, and you might just cast the person out. That's the perfect fit. Yeah. Thank you, Brian, for, for sharing that story, and uh, we'll come back again and maybe hear a little more story about Emily someday. You never know. Thank Thanks, you so Gary. much. All right. So here we go. Yeah, Brian, I heard you had one more thing to share. What What, what is it? I do. I got one more thing to share, which is I, I think for everybody listening out there, you can hear my pain point instead of feeling it. And that, I think, is the beauty in the stories of what has gone yeah. wrong, what has gone right. It's much easier to hear it than it is to endure it. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks again. You think of anything else, just we'll buzz in and get it again. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Brian. It's okay. a lot cheaper to learn it. Hey, we're back again. Uh, Brian Kelly, you're probably getting tired of hearing about Brian, but I tell you what, he's got a massive amount of wealth here and, and information that we want to share. So one other question I want to ask, Brian, if, if you know, that shop owner like yourself was working your way out of that day-to-day -day operation, right? So, how do you know when to step back in or stay out of it? Or we used to turn a while ago is confront somebody or have that hard conversation. How, how do you know when that's necessary and not? So guide us, oh, Meister, and tell us all your knowledge. Yeah, well, I love that question, Gary. That one just tees it up for me. So what I, what I heard and what immediately goes through my head is it's all small problems until they're not. And that to okay. me is always the thing that shows up is that um, myself, you know, I've, I've got story after story of this and I'll share one here in a second, but uh, it's always small conversations. When I avoid the small conversation, it becomes a big conversation. When it becomes a big mm. conversation, everything unwinds. And you know, I had an employee, and this is early on too. This is, uh, we shared some stuff about Emily. And at the time I had a, a guy named Dan working for me. And uh, there were a lot of small conversations. And I think I'm, I'm probably 27 years old at the time. Of course, I know, I mean, I know everything there is to know about cars, especially 27. So I must know everything there is to know about business. <laughs> and I certainly know everything there is to know about communication. No question about it. You know, I, I don't know what I don't know yet. And uh, I, I remember there's there's conversations to be had at my front counter. And, uh, and he would help a little on the front counter, but his primary function was repairing vehicles. And uh, his his performance had slipped to, he was producing about 18 hours a week. And uh, when mm. it 
when it slipped down to, we'll say 32, we didn't have the conversation. When it slipped down to 30, we didn't have the conversation. When it slipped down to 25, we didn't have the conversation. And, and I look at it now, and as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, man, that was a huge conversation at 32. And now I'm looking at him at 18. And, and I remember having a conversation at 18, and the conversation went something like, hey, Dan, can you tell me why we're not getting any hours? And, uh, you know, his response was, well, this is what I've been doing for 30 years. And Dan was quite a bit older. He was pushing, I think, 55, 60 at the time. This is what I've been doing for 30 years. And, you know, of course, I wasn't, wasn't prepared to have that conversation either. And I said, okay, Dan, we'll, we'll check back in. And, uh, you know, I, I think, I think <laughs> back and it's like, wow, you know, talk about no, no spine on my part, right? I didn't even have the, the, the determination to have that conversation right then. But, but that conversation got big because he stayed at 18 to 20 hours a week. And I did the calculations later on. Me not having that conversation cost me, and this is 2004, 2005, cost me somewhere in the neighborhood of forty to $55,000. And mm. how many other conversations did I not have that led to those types of disasters? And, and you know, I, I look back and I think, thank God my business didn't fold under that leadership. But uh, it was all part of the learning process, you know. So, so when it comes to communication, um, looking at every small conversation as though it's the big conversation is what drives me every single day, because it's easy to have the small conversation. Hey, Joe, I just walked back here, and you know, I've noticed that uh, you were producing about forty-five hours a week, and and you're down to forty-three. You know, is there something going on? Hmm. Yeah. That's an easy, that's an easy conversation. I come back there and, and whether you're hourly or flat rate, depending on what that looks like, if you're flat rate, I come back there and I say, Hey, you know, you're down to 18 hours and you know, he's already pissed. You know, that, that conversation was that boat <laughs> sailed six months ago and, yeah. and he's, he's been living off 18 hours. The other side of it is if he's hourly and I come back there and talk about 18 hours, I'm probably the guy emotional because I've been losing my backside for how many months. And yeah. Yeah. Either way, it was a small conversation that ain't small anymore. Yeah. You know, I always call those staff behavior sessions. And we teach how to do a staff behavior session in less than one minute. Okay. And it's, it's a process we take a lot of shop owners through. And a good friend of mine and yours too is Richard Flynn. And he has a great saying, what you don't confront, you validate. And that's really what you were talking about. You waited till that coconut got so big, it was hard to confront it without emotions clashing. And then your leadership skill wasn't ready to handle his answer. So, no. hey, wait a minute. We'll talk about this later. You know, I, I, I got to get out of this conversation because I don't know where to take it. You know, so thank you for sharing that uh, that uh, that story along the way. And and we'll we'll do a few more here in just a minute. But, man, I tell you what, this is real stuff, folks. That's why you tuned into this video to hear some real life experiences running an automotive shop and getting to where Brian is today. Took a while. Didn't happen overnight. So thank you, Brian, for sharing that. And we'll uh, talk again soon. Thank you so much. You know, Gar one thing, Gary, before we jump. Yes. You, know, you said it didn't happen overnight. But I can tell you right now, it didn't have to take as long as it did. There were a lot of easier ways to go about it than the way I did. <laughs> Amen, brother. That's that's a true statement. All right. Thank you so much. I like it. All right. Here we are again, folks. Brian Kelly, man. We've we've got him again. We've got him captive, and we're going to keep asking him questions. So there's something that always comes up in our conversations, Brian, when we we're talking about what are we going to say, how are we going to – what are we going to tell the shop owners, right? And then you brought up something called accountability and then behavior and – and, and the accountability aspect is how do you hold somebody accountable without ruffling feathers, getting them to a point where it's it's a clash of wills? How, how do you make that happen in that environment? And I love that question, Gary. That's uh, it's one of those things that uh, I, I learned this the hard way, too. And, uh, you know, being, being a high D on the disc chart, um, I'm a dominant i'm driver i i push hard and uh i've always been known in my circles of friends to love to lock horns with people 
And uh, you know, if you're doing that with employees, especially if you especially if you dominate, you're you're gonna leave a lot of bodies behind you. And uh this was yeah. something this was something I I thank God realized fairly early that uh I was I was just mowing people over. And uh and I saw mm. it and and intuitively um you know leadership training later on helped me unwind this a lot further, but intuitively I just I knew something wasn't resonating properly. And uh, you know, whether it was the fact that we both completely locked horns um and didn't get anywhere, because at the end of the day you're losing money if you're not if you're not producing. So, you know, that might have been one of the things that pushed me too, is that oh, I'm not making money when I do this. So guess what? I better re- yeah. rethink how this happens. Um it, it led me to what we call soft on the person, hard on the problem. And when it comes to accountability, I can walk out there and I can go, why did you do this? And, and I know the result from that probably ain't going to be somebody who says, Oh, well, gosh, I'm so sorry. I did that. You know, it, and maybe they will come off sarcastic like that, but, but they're not, they're not looking to own it when I accuse them. And, you know, that's when I think about accountability, um, a lot of us act in emotion and, and it starts out because, whatever happened has offended, you know, and and I think about this, I was so wrapped up in the business at one time that when an offense happened, when something went wrong, it, it attacked Mm -hmm. me. It didn't attack the business. The business was me. And, and the emotion that showed up stopped me from being able to have that accountability conversation productively. And, uh, you know, so that got me into this, what we call soft on the person, hard on the problem. And, and it's really about the decision that was made. Um, and, and, and being able to dig in and, and, and look at somebody and say, Hey, Joe, uh, you know, I noticed when you check that car out, the customer, uh, customer went out, they pulled their own floor mats and seat covers. Um, and they, they had to clean up after us. Um, I'm just wondering why, why that decision came forward. You know, what, what happened there? Help, help me understand what was going on. And mm-hmm. in coming at it in that way, there's, there's not a, people don't have to get defensive. They can they can look at you and say, "Well, I'm not sure." Okay, and in my head, I might be thinking it's because you don't freaking care. That's why. But it, but again, I'm not jumping at you with that because <laughs> right. I want I want to find out if you don't care, and I'm not going to find out if I accuse you of it. And yeah, and so that that opens the door. It allows them to see it. And and honestly, if I'm asking about it, I, I care enough to ask. So the response is. Typically now, again, I, I'll say this, that you do get employees that don't respond to this and maybe it's mm-hmm. time to take them out to lunch. And, uh, you know, the, the adage in our shop is if you go out to breakfast, that's usually the challenging point. Right. And, uh, you know, yeah. it's just, it's an action inside joke. Oh, you're going to breakfast. Hopefully, hopefully we, hopefully we see you for lunch. You know, it's the, it's the <laughs> joke, but, but if you have yeah. that wrong, if you have the wrong player, you'll know. And when it comes to accountability, being able to look at the decision, the process that got there allows you to also see if it's a can't or won't. And okay. and I always say, when I, something doesn't happen that I want, is it because they can't or is it because they won't? If it's because they can't, we're going to train you. If it's because they won't, we're going to have a conversation. And if yeah. we find that they still won't, then it's time to go to breakfast. Time to go to breakfast. I love that aspect, yeah. And uh, so, Wow. We've covered a lot in the last couple of videos, but there's just one more video I want to do. So if you're listening to this, I want you to click the next link below this one because it's where the rubber meets the road. See you in a few minutes. Brian, to kind of sum this up, and this is the last video in this particular little series that uh, Brian has been uh, more than glad to uh, to to share with us. And it's all about creating the space. And Brian talks about it quite a bit. He and I have talked about this a few times. So what's, what are you creating this space for, Brian, in what you've done with your team? And how can an automotive shop owner say, you know what, I can create that space? So define that for us a little bit and and and, and take us to the house here. Great question, Gary. I love, this is one of my favorites. Uh, Anytime we can talk about that space, the way I see it is you have to have space to lead. And it's about creating the space really for yourself. 
so that you can lead a team. And, and that mm. space allows them to contact you when needed. And it doesn't mean you have some giant open door, but it means the space is what gives you the, the time to connect with those around you. And, and that space is ultimately what allows your team to work without you. So, so much of what I do is, is really about that. And, you know, if, if I can do it, by God, anybody out there can do it because trust me, at the end of the day, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like the rest of you. I, yeah. I respond like the rest of you. I bleed like the rest of you. And uh, in this industry, there's plenty of war wounds to go around. So we can, we can share many time. And, and honestly, yeah. I, I just, I, I know that if I can do it, so can you. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, Brian. And, and just as an invitation to join us in helping you create that space for yourself so your team can do what they need to do and be available when needed just on as needed basis. So if you're interested in finding out more of how you can end up four and a half hours from your business, living in another state, and it run without you, man, contact us. And just plain and simple, call me direct, 270-282-1262. My name's Gary Gunn, and we'll continue sharing this how with you. So hope to hear from you soon. And Brian, thank you for sharing all this wisdom about creating the space for the shop owners can now live a life they really wanted when they started this business. Wow. How powerful is that? It's incredible. Incredible. Don't waste any time, folks. Get a hold of us today. Thanks so much, You're, Brian. Have I a would, great day, I would, add, I would add to that that those around you, whether it is your employees, your team, or your family, are all depending on you to do that. Amen. No doubt. Thank you so much, Brian. Bye-bye. Hey, Brian, yeah. I shut that last video down, and you started sharing something. I said, oh, we got to capture this, because this is just gold to the automotive repair people in this industry. They need to hear this story. So walk us through what your thoughts are. Yeah, so Gary, I just... It's my mission. And uh, at the end of the day, my mission is to see relationship and uh, relationship for those of us, whether we're in the leadership positions, whether we're ownership positions, whether we're automotive industry, even outside. My mission is really to see relationship restored. And whether that relationship is with our team, whether that relationship is with the friends around us, whether that relationship is with our family, our kids, our wives, our our generation around us. And that that is my mission, is to see us have time to make those relationships happen. Because I myself experienced for years the business eating me alive. And mm -hmm. I know there's a better way to do it. The business doesn't have to own me. I own the business for a reason. And I know that every relationship I had suffered when the business owned me. So that's the freedom wow. I want for other people. So using that word creating, you're creating a relationship to yourself outside the business, which gives you more value. Exactly wow. what you're doing. Powerful stuff. Brian, again, thank you for sharing. And folks, contact us. We'd love to talk to you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Like and subscribe to Auto Shop Showcase on YouTube and your favorite podcasting platform. Visit autoshopshowcase.com to sign up for monthly mentoring with Gary Gunn.